So good afternoon and thank you very much for joining me on this, on this panel. I'm Paul Dembinski, the director of the Observatoire de la Finance in Geneva and also co-president with Josina Kamerling of the Global Jury of Ethics and Trust in Finance Prize. For the prize today, it is a great, great day as we launch already the eighth edition of Ethics and Trust in Finance. This is an essay competition which will remain open until the end of May 2021. So today we open the doors of the competition by inviting young professionals and also academics to consider submitting an essay and encourage them to think about ethics in finance and trust in finance in out-of-the-box terms. So to launch this process, we are privileged to have to welcome four eminent panelists. And together with this panel, we are going to explore one or two questions about how finance can serve the best, the still pandemic and possibly tomorrow the post pandemic world. I'm moderating this from Geneva and I stress that each of the panelists, if not otherwise specified, is speaking on his own personal capacity. So let me briefly introduce the speakers for those who are going to view this, uh, this event in this opening uh, ceremony. So I start with Mrs. Helen Brand, owner of British Empire and chief executive on, of ACCA, Association of Chartered and Certified Accountants. ACCA is global professional body and is also one of the key partners of our prize. Thank you very much for doing it. Helen is a highly qualified professional with a considerable knowledge of the almost 200 mar markets in which ACNC operates. And she is member, uh, vice chair and founding member of the International Integrated Reporting Council that's, that looks to establish unique value accounting rules for the world, which is very, I think, uh, forthcoming now. Helen is a regular media commentator on the role of on the role ethics and the delivery of public value play in society. Helen is speaking from London. Let me turn now to welcome Thierry Philipponin. Thierry is a member of the board of Autorité des Marchés Financiers, the French Financial Market Authority. He is also member of Sanctions Committee at the French Bank's and insurance company supervisor at the IMF, uh, sorry, not at the IMF, at the Autorité des Marchés Financiers, maybe tomorrow at the IMF. Uh, Thierry chairs the Climate and Sustainable Finance Commission as well as its Market Consultative Commission. He is at the European, level, European Commission level, he is member of the Technical Expert Group on Sustainable Finance. And since October 2019, he joined and became the head of research and advocacy in Finance Watch think tank in Brussels. So he's between Brussels and Paris. Let me turn now and introduce her, Mr. Charles Pictet, who has had a double career of practitioner and regulator. So from 2005 to 2012, he was a member of the Swiss regulatory agency, FINMA. Prior to this, Mr. Pictet has worked for over 25 years as a partner and senior partner at Pictet, Pictet and C, a Geneva-based private Swiss bank, which through its foundation joined the circle of certain partners of the price recently. Charles has been the president of Geneva Private Bankers Association, vice president of the Swiss private bankers and member of the board of Swiss Banker Association. So very very intensive life in associative world. Currently, Charles is a member of the board of Europa Nostra Foundation and he's based in Geneva. Last but not least, let me welcome Gary Baker. Ba Gary Baker is managing director of research and advocacy and ethics at the CFA Institute, the premier 
Global Association for Investment Management Professionals, global organization again. Gary is responsible for the CFA activities in Europe, Middle East and Africa region. CFA Institute is the oldest strategic partner of the prize and once again to all the partners of the prize, a big thank you. Gary has joined CFA four years ago following a 30 years career in institutional equity research, working in all continents of the world, Asia, Australia, US and Europe. Africa is for the ne next assignment, I guess. <laughs> so this is for the introduction and thank you very much. And let's now turn to the introductory phase of this panel. And I would like to ask each of you uh, the same question or the same, submit the same problem. The world economy is hit by pandemics. Unfortunately, we know all it. And according to me, many even harder times may lay ahead. In these harder times, there is a concern that ethical and sustainability concerns might come under peculiar stress, especially if they stand in the way of quick and easy performance. So what are the risks of ethics losing tractions in finance, of seeing ethical standards and concerns slide down the corporate agenda or maybe the industry agenda in general? in an economy which is hit or possibly hardly hit by the crisis. What could, what should be done to prevent this from happening? So if possible, may I start with Helen, please? Well, thank you, Paul. Actually, I, I think the pandemic has highlighted the importance of human health and dignity. Um, where economies have adopted a people first approach and where that's been followed by governments, then we've seen a greater likelihood of both um, uh, health returning, but also uh, economic uh, recovery and trading returning as well. So the value of doing the right thing, the tangible output of doing the right thing has actually been demonstrated through, through the pandemic. I think we've also seen um, that many of the lowest paid workers in our societies have been the most valued. So whether that's care workers, uh, people working in food shops, food production, uh, transport workers. So it's really made us ask some very hard questions about what it is that we value in society and how we value people. Um, now, prior to the pandemic, I think we'd already seen and everyone will be familiar with the conversations around purpose and value for, for business. And in the USA, I think it's worth bringing this up because the USA is not usually held up as an example uh, in this regard. But in August 2019, um, one of the preeminent business lobbies, the Business Roundtable, issued an open letter entitled Statement on Purpose of the Corporation. And that was signed by around 181 CEOs of major, major corporations from Apple to Walmart. Um, and they said, each of our stakeholders is essential. We commit to deliver value to all of them for the future success of our companies, our communities and our country. So that's a real turning up on its head of the Milton Friedman, you know, the business of business is business and the CEO should focus only on the profit of that business. It's um, a real turning on the head of that, of that concept. So that was quite a profound shift and one that we're seeing uh, in many other uh, countries and markets around the world. The opportunity now is to build back better and to build back green, but it's going to require that integrated thinking that brings together that financial sustainability and all other forms of sustainability and societal impact uh, for the greater good. So you don't, you don't see the risks of ethics sliding down the agenda? You see no, it I rather moving it up? I think the public will demand ethical approaches even more vigorously than they have done hitherto in the context of recovery from the pandemic. Thank you. Sean, what, what yeah. would be your consideration about this question? Well, thank you. In my view, well, the decision taken by governments of the OCD countries are right in the sense that parallel to the already in place low interest rate environment, they acted on the fiscal side very quickly. 
To my opinion, it is better to try to avoid a long and deep recession by pouring large sum of money in the economy. It may avoid a long period of unemployment and also could limit the negative effect on the psychology of the people. As we know, or I believe, psychology is 50% of the economy and therefore of the recovery. The ethical questions lie for me in the process of the distribution of this vast amount of money, conceptually and operationally. Who deserves to get help? Under which form and how quickly? I will take the example of Switzerland. In Switzerland, it was rather well done. People could get 10% of their sales under the form of a loan for five years with no interest due for the first year. It was used within three days and the paperwork was only one page. In fact, you could fill the paper in the morning and the, in the afternoon, your bank account would be credited. In other countries, politics might play a role when particularly elections are coming like in the US. You can sign your check. A certain kind of populism can probably not be avoided and inevitably there will be some abuses. My last point is that this policy is increasing again the leverage of the economy by issuing new debt. A conversion of them in some kind of preferred shares could be proposed and for me I see an ethical question to all the means which push people to have more debt instead of equity. And I will add up to finish that my firm is more than 200 years old. And one of the reasons is that we never had any debt. Thank you. <laughs> nice example to follow. Thank you very much. <laughs> so may I turn to Gary now? What would be your consideration about this opening question to our conversation? I think there are there are some several interesting uh, aspects to it. One one I mean if we if we think about ethics then you know in traditional and previous crises we've had this initial debate over moral hazard for example what the, what role major banks play what role governments play putting bad behavior bad decisions um, cycles if you will that that debate was over in days within many many countries because there was this use that the it, it the the pandemic had affected everyone everything in such a way that you had no question you had to support life society individuals and so it was very interesting i thought that that any ethical concept of that was pushed aside and uh, you know and i think terry was right that we'll deal with that at some point point but it wasn't the right time to debating that point right now because there were greater prioritization um and i think that that is going to be the the challenge for us all as we go through this at some point there are all sorts of bills that will have to be paid there's all sorts of ways in which the economy will need to get back up on its uh, feet and start to generate income beyond state aid beyond support and I think that's really when we'll start to get into much more substantive ethical debate, discussion, and potentially conflict as to what are the trade-offs that we've got to think about here. I think Helen is absolutely right that to raise the point as to the wealth inequality, so the less, less advantaged people, perhaps lower down on the pay scale, that have really been crucial to really uh supporting activities throughout the economy and so that evaluation of where that ethical underpinning where that prioritization should be focused going forwards i think will be a key part of the debate now that will also get into sustainability because i think the question that or the the challenge that the pandemic has also exposed is time frames in which we operate in there are two really important aspects of that. One is, um, what are we preparing for? You know, if our, if our time frame is the next quarter, we prepare for very little, really. 
And I think that's what the pandemic has suggested is that preparation really has to take on a much greater time frame. And that you see then also gets into debates as to how we rebuild what the impact on sustainability is going forwards. But I think the other perhaps final point I'd make is really the other thing I think this has really brought to the fore, it's the first example you have of really directly comparing cultures and ethical cultures across the world because everyone is faced with the same issue and obviously we've had a variety of responses and there will be a lot of work done as to comparing and contrasting those responses but also i think it's slayed a few oh people will never accept that by and large if people uh, have had explanations given to them by governments or bodies that has logically taken them through an issue, they've been prepared to accept the consequences of that. And maybe that has got a lesson for us when we talk about sustainability going forwards, that part of that issue is making the urgency case, but also the argument as to does this all stack up and make, make the credible case for why action is required. And I think that has got some messaging implications as well that speak to us all. Thank you. I think that the point about uh, time frame is very important, that it is an ethical choice, of course. Time frame is not just a scientific choice, uh, objective choice. It's, uh, it's, some, it's constraint that we elaborate one from the other. Thierry, your turn. What, what are the risks and chances to see the ethics evaporate from the agendas? Mm -hmm. Good question. Maybe if I, if I may, to me, the two, well, two of the key points to understand the situation is to, to highlight the fact that first, this crisis has shown the incredible fragility of our economic system. Because when you think about it, this virus is, yes, highly contagious, but its rate of lethality is low. You know, so there's many dead people because so many people got infected. But in the scheme of everything that can happen to humanity, it's not the worst thing we can think of. Despite that fact, the economy entered into at very least a recession, if not a depression, came to a virtual standstill for a few days. And we are suffering from a clear what I would call disruption risk. So we have a big fragility of our economic system vis-a-vis -vis, you know, basically sustainability. And that's the first thing. The other thing is that we've seen that public money is not scarce when it comes to saving people, saving the essential, saving society. And as Charles very rightly said, I mean, our, our governments, and really of course there are nuances here and there all over the world but they were right to do you know what they did because it was just indispensable you know when 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 the house is burning you know you have to stop the fire and then then you 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 pick up the pieces and you see what you do so they were right to do that but then that takes us to and very rightly so sorry i'm not going to be very controversial on this one what both helen and and um and gary pointed out uh helen started it when she said you know thinking about the lowest paid workers and, 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 and Gary, you know, elaborated on this, but this is very true because when you think about it, okay, the governments did what they had to do. I think we can all agree on that. Fine. What happens next? Because if it was a case of we support the low paid people who, by the way, were on the front line to do everything that had to be done so that societies could survive, the nurses and the people working in supermarkets. I mean, you know, sorry, I don't know your lives, but I think all of us were relatively privileged. Um, but, you know, those people, you know, they paid, they were on the front line. If you ask them tomorrow to pay back the debt that will be the consequence of what governments did and were right to do, I, I insist, we're gonna have a problem. We're gonna have both an economic problem because that won't be possible and we'll have a political problem because when we needed them, we said, hey, can you come up to the front line? 
And then, oh, by the way, you have to pay back and what we gave to you will take back. So there's a big ethical question here. So I'm highlighting both a sustainability question because sustainability was, you know, is, is the foundation of the resilience uh, of our economic systems and ethical about, you know, at the end of the day, who pays the bills? And, and you know what? It's, it's a huge debate, so we're not going to have it today. But at the end of the day, it's going to be a case of, do you pay the debt back? Yes or no? You know, there's no miracle. If you pay it back, who pays back? If you don't, don't pay it back, well, creditors will say, hey, I want my money back, which is natural. It's the way the world goes. So we're going to have a big ethical and political issue there. So that's really the, the, you know, the, 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 the main points I wanted to highlight. And, and we're going to keep on di discussing it, but um, I think this is, um, this is really essential. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You, you have, all of you have, uh, each of you has shown to what extent ethics is very present, even if you are in a kind of, not a period of ethical suspension, but ethics of urgency. And this is also a part of ethics. With the, the reactivity of decisions taking into account the situation of danger and threat. So let's move. Thank you very much for this. And let's move to the second part of this, uh, of this panel, which I would like to address each of you with a specific theme that we discussed a little bit in the preparatory, preparatory conversation. So once again, I will start with Helen, if I may. And uh, uh, during this month, we have been, became all technology specialists somewhere. And we have seen to what extent we depend on technology and uh, willing or not willing, <laughs> we had to, to, ride, to, to ride the path somewhere. So this trend will continue probably. It started before, it will continue after the pandemics. However, the extensive use of technology, especially in finance, in accounting, and this kind of service sector, brings specific ethical challenges when there is no face-to-face -face or very seldom face-to-face -face meetings and so on and so on, uh, there are new challenges, there are new ethical dilemmas also. So I know that you have been working on these issues personally, you are interested in this issue, and ACCA has been addressing also internally some of these issues. So could you share some thoughts with us about this, please? Thank you. Yes, um, we've been researching this topic for a number of years now. Um, and. You know, the headline is that AI, artificial intelligence and digital uh, technology and channels in all their forms actually increase the need for ethical behaviour and ethical consideration rather than decrease it. That's absolutely been consistent through all the work we've, we've done. Um, in 2017, we did a big survey. We had 10,000 um, respondents from around the world uh, professional accountants and trainees, and 500 of them, of them were C-suite um, executives. And more than eight in, in 10 of those were the view that strong ethical principles and behavior were gonna become more important in the evolving uh, digital age. And that was echoed by the C-suite executives who were looking to the finance professionals in their organizations and businesses to uh, provide that ethical compass and dimension both internally and externally. So that was a, an interesting uh, finding. The, the fundamental principle of ethics, um, which the respondents found most at risk, was actually pro professional competence and due care within a digital context. Um, and I think that might, because the, the, the information and the environment is new, therefore, understanding the approaches you need, the ethical approaches you need is sometimes uh, challenging for an individual. They don't know they're being competent in a very new uh, environment. Um, and of course, if the professional accountant, the finance professional doesn't have an understanding of that digital uh, environment, then it's very difficult for them to apply their professional judgment. So we 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 are looking at now in, t in in training professional accountants in training all professionals actually that broader range of competencies that you're going to need to be effective it doesn't mean you have to have be you know absolute technical expert digitally but you do have to have an awareness of the implications um, of the systems and the data and the analysis that you're looking at otherwise you can't apply that judgment uh, effectively um, 
when it came to asking people, well, how are you, how are you going to be most effective in the digital environment? The professional code of ethics was chosen as the number one um, means to being effective by individuals. So uh, ethics starts with me, I guess, was the principle, you know, making sure that they had that ethical compass absolutely embedded um, in their professional lives and in the way in which they they've been trained and in terms of the organization leadership was uh, brought out as the most important factor in driving ethical behavior in the digital environment so not probably not so different as the um, non-digital environment but certainly strong ethical leadership was seen as uh, as very important in setting uh, the tone we've we've looked more recently at um, crime, uh, economic crime within the digital environment, so cyber security, cyber crime, etc. Um, we did we issued a report on this at the beginning of 2020 with EY, uh, the accountancy firm, um, and there we talked about three things: anonymity, accessibility, and accountability. So the the anonymity of criminals when they access these systems and their ability to to do that. Um, the accessibility to organisations through the internet, through digital channels, um, and then the accountability in terms of the, the, the balance between the regulatory and business uh, uh, accountability that needs to be struck to make sure that we limit the exposure. So that research very clearly called for um, collaboration right across the professions in the finance world to ensure that we are uh, working together to combat uh, cybercrime and applying you know, professional ethical codes to, uh, to that use of data, to access to organisations, um, as we frame that uh, ethical business world for the digital age. Thank you very much. Of course, when listening at you, I was wondering, because I think Gary said, maybe somebody else during this conversation, that this per per period has seen different ethic ethics uh, interacting at the global stage. So, of course, when we refer to ethics, we all have the, me the impression that there is only one entry point to into it. Mm. But geography and globalization has shown that there are many. So it would be another conversation to deepen maybe this aspect, how different approaches to ethics interact in the unified technological world. But maybe we, if we <laughs> we need a very long time for that conversation. Although it's interesting, um, the the currency profession we do have a, a single global code of ethics, and I do think that enables um, the right business conversations to be had. Um, but then you overlay culture and environment, and part of that environment can be the digital piece, um, and that that's challenging. But I think. Uh, identifying those fundamental principles that can be abided um, to by everybody can actually be very powerful for business and for professions. Thank you very much. So let me turn to Chow now. As, uh, as I said, he has a double experience of regulator and uh, banker, but I would draw on the regulatory side. And uh, as we have seen in the response to pandemics, financial regulators, European, Swiss, American and so on, are easing some of the constraints that they have imposed after the great financial crisis, especially in terms of capital requirement. So these moves of regulators have by themselves a kind of ethical dimension, but they may also have consequences on the ethical behavior of regulated institutions. For instance, they may, they may affect the level of trust between the clients and the institution and possibly it, they could also be understood but by some of the industry members maybe not all understood or misunderstood as a green light for less supervision for less compliance and possibly at the end for less ethics so what would be your reaction to this statement uh, mr Pictet? really thank you paul well, it's going to be a little bit a technical answer uh, because uh, since 2008, bank, banks were forced to deleverage their balance sheet. The, indeed, the governments were not ready to bail out banks again. And they are now stronger, the banks, in a certain way. 
The easing of the capital requirement proposed today, you mentioned, can be understood by the idea that everything should be undertaken to help the economy to recover. Fine. To achieve this goal, banks should be encouraged to, to increase more lo their loans. Indeed, in the last 10 years, the velocity of money has gone down and the bank multiplicators went from nine to three about. The money supply provided by the central banks have just filled this gap of these two trends. Is this, is, is this easing of capital requirement going to have an effect on the bank's activity? I have some doubt. However, psychologically, I come back to this word, it is probably a right decision. But for me, the problem lies elsewhere, the existing loan books. With the present crisis, credit default will probably accelerate and risk to reach new peaks. Some banks have already taken important provision. This economic environment will put pressure on the bank's capital. And in this sense, the easing of the requirement looks problematic. This is a question of trust. Banks' ratings are already going down with introduction, in many cases, of the mentioned negative outlook. On top of this trend, I would like to mention the monetary policy followed by the central banks for the last years. Very low interest rates have put the basic business model of commercial bank granting loans into questions. The margin effect on credit is not high enough to cover large loans losses. In the last 10 years, the net margin on credits worldwide went down from 4% to 2%. So what is the incentive of banks to grant credits? Instead, they have tried to find new financial means to supplement their revenues. For example, with products, which in order to provide a minimum yield needs a lot of leverage again. And then come the ethical question of the suitability of these products for the investors. And how, ma how many investors do understand the finality and the mathematics of these products as well as the management? As the bond and equity market are less and less liquid, the pandemic has produced a vertical collapse of the market. Collaterals could not always be provided quickly enough, and losses occurred both for banks and clients. Leverage, 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 always come back on this. <laughs> so for me, the big ethical question lies unwillingly by the Trenton banks, inducing everybody to prefer debt to capital. And as Thierry mentioned, one day you have to pay the bill. So it's a devil plantation with the debts. Finally, the regulators are de facto very unhappy with this situation because more debts mean more risk for the financial institution and more work for the regulators. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's, uh, so that is devil temptation. <laughs> Take this. But what the governments are doing, they are producing more and more debt that we mentioned in the first part of the of the mm -hmm. conversation and probably to which we are going to come in the next minutes. So turning to Charles, uh, to, sorry, to, to, to Gary, uh, CFA is a worldwide professional training organization. So you have put very high on the agenda the ethical concern and you are head of this uh, part of activity worldwide of CFA. So the world, possibly the new world will be slightly different from the one we knew before. And there will be new ethics, new, eti new settings in which ethics will be called, or called upon. New ethical reflexes will be, will be needed. So how you see the needs of the upcoming generations in terms of ethical training? Did the, did the pandemic change your analysis in this field? And what are the priorities somewhere here for you? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I think, you know, that the that last question you're asking i think is really the one i think every business out there is really trying to 
consider now and contemplate as to where is the pandemic taking us? You know, as we emerge from this, then what does that business world look like? What's the world of work look like? What's the world of learning look like? Uh, and obviously, you know, we we given out our role in credentialing and that desire to to ensure relevance. I mean, that's really what we always talk about. How do you stay relevant? How do we ensure what we're trying to, the knowledge we're trying to impart to people, how is that still going to be relevant to you, even in a post-pandemic world? And I think that's a challenge for obviously all education institutions at this point. I suspect, however, that really what you've still got to do is use these core building blocks. I mean, ethical dilemmas, ethics, frameworks, are still absolutely the foundational elements of which you've got to start. Uh, so I think within the, the programs that we set, um, you know, the ethical portion is the one constant. You know, we've been setting exams for since 1963. Ethics has always been around 10 to 15 percent of every exam that, that we set. Uh, some people enjoy that. Some people absolutely hate that. Um, but it is always there as a constant. And I think that's probably stood us in good stead. But really, I think it explains one activity. I mean, to me, ethics, it's, there, there are three elements to it. One is you, you've got to have the awareness. You've got to be teaching it. You've got to be providing frameworks. Uh, you've got to be talking about it. I mean, that's, that's one of the key elements. But then secondly, it's the analysis. So that framework being put into a context which you can then deal with other examples as they as they come along. But then crucially, and the thing that we, we try and emphasize a lot is then the need to act. How do you give people confidence to act, whether that's speaking up, whether it's changing their behavior or trying to influence behavior? Um, and that, I think, is the challenge for us all is it's not enough to just be aware of it. You've got to give people the tool set the confidence, the backing, uh, and the framework to be able to act as well. And I think we, we talk a lot about that within how we set ourselves up. So essentially, we do three things. We're taking that as our analysis. We, we have our credential, the CFA program primarily, but also CIPM. But then secondly, we do a lot on professional learning. Um, you know, some of it we work with ACCA and partnership there because you know some of the activities they do are fantastic within that professional learning area but then thirdly we also work a lot with regulators with governments on codes and standards because we you know it's all very well trying to teach people the eth the ethical framework but you really need governments to be also setting that playing field in which you can operate and i think we really have to give each one of those three areas initial education, ongoing learning, but also the, the governmental frameworks, equal billing in terms of getting all of those aspects right. So will a post-pandemic world change things? I mean, I guess it gets back to the, the earlier question as to how it affects and impacts priorities. I think we will be faced with very similar ethical dilemmas. I don't see that changing uh, necessarily um, if you actually get to the root of what the ethical issue is. Um, but we have to make sure that we are helping people to adapt. And I think a lot of that comes through in case studies. I think ultimately ethics can come across as a very dry exercise. The more that we can contextualize that, put color to it by talking about real life case examples that, that really resonate with people. That to me is always the key to this. That's where classrooms go from, I'm here to take a box to I'm here to be engaged because suddenly it becomes a lot more apparent. And so it's, it's, it's really, there's no one element I would say that is gonna guarantee that we can maintain an ethical focus. I think we've all gotta be working across a whole range of activities. That's certainly what CFA Institute is engaged with. Thank you very much. You did not mention the corporate culture. Wow, well. <laughs> because we, we have some in the essays, in the past years, we have seen the conflict between the professional ethics that somebody is carrying with him or personal ethics and the corporate culture and what to do. But 
Just... Well, the corporate culture is one. I, the other area that fascinates me at the moment is, yeah, we are obviously engaged in trying to set professional standards of behavior, but that blurring of the line between professional, private, public is quite an interesting uh, situation, I think, at the moment as to if a, if a company has that code of ethics standard they have adopted, how far into people's personal space does that always does that also take them and we there's a couple of examples at the moment there's one quite prominent one in the states as to the extent to which it does that wherever you are your corporate code of ethics goes with you because corporates feel that they have to judge you on your public space as well and i think that's that's a very interesting discussion and debate as well I have turned the mic off, sorry. Uh, let's turn to Thierry, who is, as we have heard, a specialist and uh, early advocate of uh, sustainable investing and sustainable finance in general. So, as we know, one of the core functions of finance is to channel funds to investment projects with different profiles of return and uh, risk. But today, there is a third dimension which is added, which is sustainability. So when the pandemic, as some advocate, will accelerate the importance of sustainability criteria in investment choices, but others would say, yes, it will play out only for the funds that are coming from the public purse. In the private sector, it will not move so quickly and in the same kind of magnitude. So your commitment theory for financing the sustainable projects, which is not necessarily the same as sustainable finance in general uh, is well known. So in this, the really, according to your judgment, the pandemic or post-pandemic world would be an opportunity for sustainable financing, or on the other side, it will probably block one or two of these nice initiatives. How many hours do you give me? <laughs> <laughs> um, I know your synthetic spirit. Okay, let's go straight to the point. Before I answer, you know, is it an opportunity, you know, this crisis to, 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 to push this agenda? I think there's two or three parameters to, to put in place very, very clearly. First of all, when we talk about sustainable finance, what are we talking about? Um, in my view, let's try Let's start by defining what finance is. In my view, finance is, the purpose of finance is allocating capital to the economy. I'll be very, very simple. So if you say finance is about allocating capital to the economy, then sustainable finance should be allocating capital to a sustainable economy. Now, let's look at what private sustainable finance is doing today. Is it allocating capital to a sustainable economy? Well, my joke was about how many hours do I have? You know, so I, I, I'll keep a very long story short. Um, I think sustainable finance today does not allocate capital to a sustainable economy. It allocates capital to the sustainable fraction or it tries to allocate capital to a sustainable fraction of our economy, which is already something very interesting. But what, what do I mean here? If you're managing, you know, let's take the largest asset managers in the world. Like, and I'm not pointing at anyone in particular, but you, you're managing trillions. Okay, how do you do when you manage trillions? Well, you invest in about everything there is out there because, because of the mass you have to manage, you buy the world as it is. Is the world sustainable? Mm debatable. Uh, IPCC is telling us that the world is on a path, I'll just take one example, of global warming at plus four degrees at the end of this century. It's not me saying it, or it's saying between 3.7 and 4.8. Let's call it plus four, four degrees at the end of the 21st century. Fine. If you manage trillions while well, you buy a little bit of everything on this planet, and therefore you cannot be aligned with the Paris Agreement. And that's not because you're, you're cynical, it's not because you're you, whatever, it's just the way it is. So 
the best you can do when you manage that money is to try and there's a, 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 a big and very difficult question about, you know, can you do that when you're a very large size? And on purpose, I took the very large size example. But if you manage more reasonable amounts, you know, can you try to allocate capital to that fraction of the world that can claim to be sustainable? And behind that question, there's also the question of what do we mean by sustainable? And there's also the question of greenwashing. Let's call it spade a spade. Um, here again, huge topic, but there are two levels to understand the, the, the issue of greenwashing. The first level is, do you as a financier do what you say you're doing when you say I'm doing sustainable finance? Is there a relationship between your word and your act? Okay. And the second level is, is what you're doing impactful? Does it make a difference? It's not at all the same question. What some supervisors are doing today is they have started to attack the first level. You know, do you do what you're saying you're doing? Which is really a good step. You know, you, you have to start there. But then the most difficult one is, you know, is what you're doing impactful? I'll stop here on this particular example before I switch to public finance, because you asked a question about public finance and then opportunity of this crisis. But, you know, just to show the depth of the issues and, and the difficulty as it is, because many private financiers, and you can hear the reasoning, say, look, at the end of the day, I know I'm also financing things that are not sustainable, but my job is to finance the world as it is. Uh, so, you know, how, how do you reconcile the two? And, uh, and it, it is striking that the largest, and that's true, on the banking side, and that's true on the asset management side, the largest institutions in the world are at the same time the biggest providers of green finance and of finance to unsustainable activities. It's fact. And, and the reason is, is that what well, they're doing business. And you know, you know what, guess what? They are private entities. And that takes us to the good old debate but public interest versus private interest. And you cannot ask everything from a private actor. Private actor is not in charge of the public interest. So, you know, uh, there's so much it can do uh, for that. And the whole sustainable finance agenda so far has been based on the assumption that transparency would solve the issue, make it get the right information, the good information, the right quantity and the right quality of information, and then, and then good things will happen. My short answer to this would be, yes, you need to do that without any doubt. Please do it and keep on doing it. And I spend a lot of time working on, on, those, on that agenda, but don't think that doing only that will suffice. And there's much more to do. Then on the public side, public finance, um, well, there's, 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 there's a point where you need public finance to step in. And then there's many difficulties, which are fiscal difficulties and everything, but conceptually, uh, why do you need public finance to step in? Because some of the things that we need, we collectively as human beings, are simply not in the for-profit world. Take the example of biodiversity. You know, you have three types of biodiversity finance, you know, for restoration, um, uh, conservation or transition. But certainly restoration and conservation, most projects are of small size, high risk, limited return, if any return. If you combine those three elements, ask a private financier to provide the finance, will tell you, I'm sorry, but the person who gave me his or her money wants a return. You know, sorry, can't help you. Um, or, or, you know, it's, it's extremely difficult. And this is where you need public finance to step in because, you know, private finance cannot do everything. It strikes me when you go in a biodiversity conference in the good old days where we would get together, um, you would have the biodiversity specialist saying it is very important and biodiversity is in great danger. We'll agree on that. And then invite one, two, three financiers and say, I agree, but I don't know how to tackle the issues. I don't know where to take it from. 
because I'm sorry, but if I don't get the right risk return uh, ratio, it is not in my fiduciary duty to do it. Um, and that's very understandable. And this is where you need public finance to step in. Now that's a, so is the crisis a risk or an opportunity for this? I think it's an opportunity if we overcome the predictable debate about, you know, between the, it's the eternal debate between the, the so-called pragmatists who say, hey, business, 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 we have to, to, to recover very quickly in the short term and, and start making money again. And, you know, the people who say, hey, think long term. We have to overcome this debate and realize that sustainability is not about dreaming about a world that would be perfect or anything like that, but it's a condition for any human society to, 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 to become prosperous um, before anything else. So um, I anticipate a debate that's not going to be easy, and we see the, the debate emerging today already. Um, but I think we have to be very, very, um, well, um, I, when I say we, I'll certainly put myself in that camp, very, very clear in explaining why this is just indispensable. Because if, you know, if you like the COVID crisis, you're going to love the climate change crisis. I mean, we've seen, we've, you know, it's, what we've seen is absolutely nothing compared to what our children and grandchildren will see in 50 or 100 years time. So um, this is not only about being an idealist, you know, I would love the world to be perfect, not at all. It is about, you know, being responsible as to taking the world as it is. And if we don't address the question of fragility of our systems, the rest just does not exist. Thank you very much, Thierry. We just want to, to spot maybe that we slightly changed the name of the prize this year. We did still ethics and trust in finance. But for a sustainable, we added in small print for a sustainable world. So it goes in the, in the, in the direction that you mentioned. Well, yeah. we have a few minutes if you want to react one to the other, because we have heard a lot of uh, very interesting things coming from different perspectives. So we have a possibility for short interaction. Who would venture to turn on its mic? Uh, well, I, I, I did think... I picked up what uh, Gary was saying about well, and what you said about corporate culture. Um, but I do think at the end of the day, corporate culture is only made up of individual behaviors. Um, and so I think starting with that individual behavior um, and taking it from the leadership and then through the organization is what is going to, to drive the culture. So, to, uh, and Gary also said about doing, talking, <laughs> explaining, I think that constantly being part of the conversation within the corporation is absolutely key and it shouldn't be a compliance exercise it should be part of what's driving your reputation and value within within the organization so i do think um taking it to the individual is not a bad thing it certainly has to be the starting point thank you somebody wants to join yeah i think we've we've, we've done quite a lot of work it specifically with some actually with the large asset management firms on this that you know obviously you know every firm in the world has compliance requirements ethical requirements you know your online training etc but what we found uh, with some firms is we've gone in and done a very bespoke piece of work with them usually we've asked them if we can uh, use a couple of examples that would be more specific to them so you develop case studies and the levels of engagement from that are just extraordinary the you know it, and, and i think it surprised the firms involved that you know in one firm we took we we did five uh, seminars 450 senior managers went through this process and the feedback was extraordinary just simply because it, it took them out of that environment and put them in a place where it was safe to talk about these things, no holds barred, no click through, I've got five minutes to finish this before uh, I'm told to, you know, I'm not in, in compliance this year. It was a totally different environment and a totally different end result. And I think, you know, that takes a lot of time and effort, obviously, but I think it was very worthwhile for some of those corporates we've uh, engaged with on this. Charles, you want to add something? Well, uh, 
the you mentioned about the ethics but how you teach ethics with the remote work from home through a computer and this is a big problem because uh, in our firm we have the inboarding of people so we cannot inboard them because there is only 20 percent of the people in the firm so you cannot give them the spirit of the firm the culture of the firm so this is a problem with these electronic things because you don't have the people in front of you thank you very important thierry you want to add something before we move to the last part of the conversation maybe one or two sentences on uh, on what the, the the subject that uh, that Charles addressed, uh, you know, regulation and and you know, in the crisis and relaxing of, of, of requirements and everything. Obviously, I've done quite a bit of work on that as well. It's uh, my different hats on. Uh, I think it's very interesting because for over the past twelve years, regulators have seen a very 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 strong pushback against more regulation and higher capital requirements and you name it but the reason when you think about it broadly speaking we collectively were right to release the pressure in the midst of the crisis because it's not the time to be pro-cyclical so yes do release the pressure the reason why we're able to release the pressure is because the pressure had been put high enough before so I think this crisis, if anything, is showing that we were right to do what we did collectively over the past 12 years. Whether that will prove sufficient is another story. And Charles very rightly pointed out to the fact that there could be, I forget if you use those words, but there could be a paradox of, you know, of relaxing requirements at a time where expected losses by nature by contraction are going to be increasing. So striking the right balance between the two is, 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 is going to be a delicate exercise. Um, um, certainly we at Finance Watch push for the fact that showing some understanding as to, okay, you can delay measures and the finalization of Basel III and, and a few other measures is understandable, but it shouldn't be a renouncement because if you renounce, well, that's exactly what you were saying, Paul. You, you, you sort of break the trust between the public in general and in this particular instance, a banking world. That's from a, an ethical standpoint. And obviously from a technical standpoint, you, you do not make the system solid enough uh, to ensure that we don't have moral hazard because at the end of the day, it's a moral hazard question. And obviously moral hazard is, is, is perhaps the big ethical issues uh, in finance. Um, you know, some people will oppose that you make money at all in the first place, but to me, it's not the big ethical issue. The big ethical issue is that if I you know, play a game where, you know, as I win until you lose, then we have a problem. If, you know, if I take the profits and the losses, it's not an issue. So let's not forget that debate. Thank you very much. So let's now turn to, we are more on schedule, which is wonderful. So let's turn to the last question I wanted to, to ask you, because we are opening the competition. So we are speaking mainly to potential young authors, professionals, or academics. So where would you put, you, put your finger on, on, in terms of ethical, interesting ethical, upcoming ethical concerns uh, re related to trust, related to sustainability or whatever, you think important to be addressed or as suggestions, of course, it is not a commitment or by the price or neither by the jury, but it's just a mentoring few sentences about what seems to you to be of interest to be tackled as starting as starting of tomorrow. Who would start first? Who would venture first? Shall I? Uh... Yes, please. <laughs> so, uh, I, I guess Carrying on with the theme I talked about earlier, the digital um, developments and what they mean for ethics and trust, I think are fascinating. And, you know, as we get flooded with more and more information and opinions um, through the digital channels, how is that going to be treated? Um, I think professionals probably understand the issues around that. But what would be interesting um, to hear 
the perspectives from uh, the participants is on how the public might be educated, uh, on how to discern the, the information that they're receiving, um, how do they know they can trust institutions, organisations, and what channels and, and uh, what should they be using to, and what information should be they using to base their trust upon. Um, so I think I think that public uh, education and awareness piece is is really critical. So Thank that you. would be interesting. <laughs> Thank you. Next. No, I I I well I I'd echo that to 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 a large extent, and also you know one aspect that Shah just talked on, which is you know I I I think there's some very interesting dilemmas ahead as to that uh, trust online and. And really, the, you know, if you're in a world where there is less direct face-to-face -face interaction, in-person interaction, what are the consequences of that? How do you develop okay. systems or methodologies to compensate for that? Um, you know, whether that uh, is scoring systems. So, you know, if you're in on your online meeting, you will have some kind of metric available that, you know, it, it sounds awfully spooky but that is the technology equivalence of it that you've got some kind of trust barometer or ethical barometer that is um, already applied uh, a trust scoring system i'm sure that you know they are being talked about thought about acted but acted upon at this moment but um i think the the other thing that uh i think maybe more tactically is Ultimately, it still comes down to stories and narratives. And I think if you're, if you're trying to write about trust in finance, I think you, know, you can go one of two ways. I think you've either go, go from the specific, a specific story, and then come up with a, a more general application, or the other way around. You, you can't boil the ocean, but you've got to survey the ocean and find that way of really drilling down to something that brings it uh, to life. And I think that's the challenge. You, you, you've got to be quite specific, I think, in, in how you develop uh, that storyline, because ultimately that's, that's where the engagement really happens. And we are still in that business of human engagement. Yes, machines will have their role to play, but I'm an absolutely eternal optimist on the role of humans within that process. So. Uh, I still find there's a lot of uh, excitement and interest in terms of developing that strand. Thank you for this words of suggestions, Thierry or Charles. Wow, many things. I mean, um, yes, human responsibility is 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 the key, um, and it will always be, um, despite. And you know, I, I could I could extend on on what Gary just said, but. Uh, um, you, you, you can take many examples, you know, applying technology to the financial world. Fine, you're applying technology, but behind technology, you have human beings. Who's responsible? Uh, okay, that's a very ethical case. And you mentioned the fact that uh, I, I work, or I have a function uh, as, as a supervisor on the sanction side. Well, you take responsibility of financial institutions in anti-money laundering and financing of terrorism. And then some of them, you know, today are saying, hey, I'm going to have that super software in, in artificial intelligence that will allow me to detect all the bad guys in the world. Good. You know, I applaud. Who's responsible if it doesn't work? Oh, it's not me. It's the software maker. Oh, well, uh, okay, I'll stop here. But we see that, you know, Technology is, you know, if we have a very clever piece of technology that enables us to detect, you know, uh, financing of terrorism, who could be against that apart from terrorists? But you still need a human responsibility to say, hey, I've done my job. And you cannot, you know, sort of delegate your responsibility. And that goes back to, 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 to the question of trust, because... I don't know about you, but you know, I can I can use a tool and a machine, software, intelligence, artificial intelligence is a tool. But you know, a tool is a tool. I use the person who uses the tool, and I think if we if we if we abandon that, uh, we'll become very very dry, and 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 life will become meaningless. I don't want you to go into you know um, 
too easy philosophy, but uh, that's really what I think. And um, you said, you know, perhaps word of advice for, for young people going to, into that field. I would, I, would, I would encourage them to always think that there's two things, well, that's true of all public affairs, but certainly in finance, which have to be taken into account together, which is public interest and private interest. And you have the apostles of public interest and there's no such thing as private interest. Oh, is there not? And there is some people who say, you know, I don't care about public interest. The only thing I care about is private interest. Please, I, I urge you, be open and understand that the world is a combination of both and that you have to strike the right balance. And if you abandon that way of thinking, you will not go anywhere. And I, I'm absolutely convinced that the people who make a difference, and there are quite a lot of them, thank God, are the ones who can understand that. So for young people going to that sort of uh, career or interested in those topics, um, please don't forget that. So read Adam Smith. Thank right. you. <laughs> Which Adam Smith? The two of them. I don't know. <laughs> Charles, closing world. Well, I will take you in another world again. It's a problem of the debt. This pandemic issue has really put forward a huge problem, which I don't know how we are going to solve it. When we speak about sustainable finance, it's a long-term issue which needs capital and not debt. And uh, uh, is the present situation sustainable in this sense? And this creation of debt on all levels is taking the trust away from the people versus governments and maybe private sectors in the second round. And when you have, you lose this trust, then you have a fragile economy built on sands and uh, uh, which can provoke very quickly unemployment of movement right or left if you don't have uh, uh, capital as an equity. So if I was under 35, this is your question, I would say, how could I convert this debt into capital in a way. And I would like to mention a paper which just came out recently from Mr. Professor Dantin, who was a vice president of Swiss National Bank, about these loans made to Swiss companies. He said, maybe we should try to propose them to make a preferred shares with no um, uh, right to vote, no access to reserves, which could be, which would be remunerated by dividends and which could be bought back at par in a way to make companies stronger, which then will allow them to have more debt and then can start to invest because you invest for the future with your capital and you just pay your loans and the little things with the debt. But you don't build a society, you don't build the future for our children, you don't build against the, uh, the warming up of the earth with debt, you do it with capital. And my big worry also is that we go back maybe to the situation in 2008, uh, when I was with the FINMA, where we said AAA uh, 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 bonds are government bonds. And suddenly we started to have doubts about the states. So as the bank was full with government papers, we started to have doubts about banks. And then it started to go in crisis like this. So, for me, one of the themes for the younger people is how do we change the incentive to go out of the debt and more into the equity? Voila. Thank you very much. Now would come the time of applause, which I'm the only one to provide you. And thank you very much. And you, we're sharing this wealth of ideas for the, with the young people that potentially will join the competition and will deepen maybe some of in the direction that one or two of you indicated and hopefully we will have a not pandemic award ceremony somewhere towards the end of 2021. So thank you very much and all the best to you.